In September of 1943, the Chief of Ordnance proposed that in order to attack the German Westwall fortifications, a new vehicle be created carrying a 105mm gun and 8 inches of armor. Actually, 25 of them. They would be equipped with the petrol electric transmission found on the T 23 medium tank. However, Army Ground Forces decided to take a little while chewing on the problem. It must not have been much of a priority. So in March of 1944, they decided, yeah, okay, let's authorize procurement of five vehicles. But perhaps with the T-23 experience in mind, they decided, no, this is going to be a conventional transmission. And maybe we should make it a full 12 inches of armor. Now, as it happened, castings would be made for both 8 inch and 12 inch vehicles and both were shot at uh, but ended up being produced as a 12 incher the vehicle was going to be named heavy tank t28 which is fine then there was a problem because somebody had a look at it and they realized well the thing doesn't have a turret surely a tank has to have a turret it's not a tank they decide in march of 1945 instead it is a self-propelled gun or in the terminology of the time, a gun motor carriage. Now, gun motor carriages could be any form of self-propelled gun from a wheeled tank destroyer to a 240 millimeter gun on tracks. Uh, but anyway, it got renamed as the 105 millimeter gun motor carriage T95. And so it was good for about a year. And then the army had another rethink on the matter. And so I'm going to have to read this verbatim because I'm not going to get it right by memory. It is now considered that the restricted traverse on the vehicle should not be the determining factor as to whether the vehicle should be called a tank or a gun motor carriage. Since a gun motor carriage is usually characterized by the provision of relatively light armor protection and the subject vehicle is provided with a maximum of armor, and therefore satisfies the accepted requirements for a tank, namely a combination of maximum firepower and maximum armor protection, it is considered advisable to rename this as a tank. And so it was done. April 1946, the vehicle was renamed again to Super Heavy Tank T-28, the designation which it retains to this day. Now, if you want to come and see one, well, you haven't got much choice. You got to come here to Fort Moore, Georgia. The vehicle is described in the manual as an all welded structure of heavy armor, steel castings and plates. It is divided into two compartments. There is a watertight pressure sealed bulkhead between the engine compartment and the fighting compartment, which also provides a little bit of reinforcing support for the roof structure. The two vehicles which were actually completed by the Pacific Car and Foundry of Renton, Washington, were both completed with 12-inch castings at the front. Now, as you're looking at it, not only do you have the 12 inches at the front, well, the mantlet is very large as well, 11 and a half inches, but somewhat rounded. Now, if memory serves, the lower hull is five inches, sloped at 59 degrees. The overall vehicle is a 6 foot 11. It's a surprisingly low vehicle for how large it is. You add another foot or so for the cupola, and then if you really have to, you add another foot for the caliber 50 machine gun ring. But generally speaking, this is actually not all that big a vehicle until you get to the width. And that's where the unique construction of T-28 comes in. Now, unlike most other countries that were playing around with super heavy tanks, they would take a track and make a wider track. So Mouse's track was really wide. The OI track was really wide. Tortoise's track, really wide. Yeah, well, the Americans still had the small problem that they were building these things in Washington, which is not really near the German West Wall. They had to get it a very long way. And it would be very handy if they could still get the thing to keep to the railway loading gauge. And the only way to do that and to keep an acceptable ground pressure by spreading the weight of this monster over more ground was something to add two sets of track and have the outer set detachable when you wanted the tank to be a little bit narrower. 
And it, it's kind of a similar concept to the Germans that they had the transport tracks and the combat tracks. Except this time, it was all one piece. You didn't have to drag a second set of tracks around with you. Except when it didn't fit on the main tank, and then you did literally have to drag a second set of tracks around with you. So, instead of the 23-inch tracks that you would find on, let's say, a late Sherman or a Pershing, these are actually unique tracks. They're 20 inches, two sets side by side, but we're going to see that the suspension is not unusual. Right, while I'm at the front, I might as well talk track tension. Twice the tracks, twice the tension. So there's two ways of checking the tension. There's the book way, and there's a way that was found in testing. The book way is where you get down and you look up under her skirt. Ooh, Matra. And you would see if there was any noticeable sag. And then what you would do is you'd start driving the vehicle and zigzagging it, and watching to see if there was any tendency of the track to walk off. What they discovered in testing, though, was what you could do instead was you could run the vehicle up on lumber. So you would place the lumber in front of either the inner pair of tracks or the outer pair of tracks, run it up so that the other pair of tracks was now dangling in the air. And you could then very easily see if the track needed any form of tensioning. And it also helped with the tension process because there is now no stress on the track at all other than simply the weight of the metal of the track. When you decided that, yes, you did need to actually tension your track, that's where the winches come in. Now, the normal stowage position for the winches are both on the right-hand side, facing out. However, this is a museum, people are walking around, and doubtless, people didn't want to be running in to these winches sticking out the side of the vehicle as they're going around oogling this rear vehicle. Going, oh my, look at this, look at this, thwap probably liability that the museum doesn't want. So what they've done is they have mounted us here on the inside facing inwards. Now, again, there is an obvious problem with this. Traverse the, the ball mount and you're probably gonna run the risk of interfering with the winch. The winches had multiple taskings on this vehicle and one of them was track tension. So each track at the front, they have these four mounting points and all, all they are is basically bolts and a nut, a square nut on the inside that holds it in place. And you can see the ones at the front are angled slightly over these plates. So you would mount your witch here, you would bolt it in place, you would then unbolt the couple inch thick protecting uh, plate, pull that out of the way, you could then leverage the eccentric idler arm using the winch and then move to the opposite side. Then when you have tensioned the two outer or the two inner tracks, roll the vehicle forward, move the lumber to the other pair of tracks, roll the vehicle back, and now you have the other pair of tracks are now hanging in the air. Move the winches to the other side, again, the, the opposite mountings, and repeat as necessary. The side skirts are four inches thick. When you get up to the upper hull, it's two and a half inches and stoked at 57 degrees. Now the suspension is HVSS, not quite identical to that found on Sherman's for two reasons. A, there are no shock absorbers on the HVSS bogies. And secondly, the return rollers are also not an integrated part of the bogey, such as they would be on a Sherman. Instead, that's what these little trapezoidal bolts are, is there's a return roller on the inside of those. You'll also be able to see the traditional mounting for the HVSS bogey, the bolts along the whole side, and also underneath. Because if you look at a HVSS bogey, it actually goes under the whole side, and some of the weight is supported by an outer arm of the bogey. Track. Each track is 20 inches. Makes it a little bit narrower than late model or uh, Sherman or Pershing track. There are a hundred links per side. So Nick, you may ask, how do you actually take it apart? Well, it turns out after recording this the first time, it takes about 15 minutes to discuss, and apparently not everybody is wanting to watch a video for 15 minutes, just how you take apart the track on T28. So here's the short, short version. It's held on by six of these very thick pins. And before you take those off though, you gotta release some of the weight on the track. So you gotta, basically you tie up the wheels and the tracks. There is a spline at the back here. You have to remove the cover that was here. You pull the spline out. 
that starts the disconnect process between the outer and the inner sprockets. You then pull down these stabilizing rods. There's one front and back. They're officially called sprags. Once that's down and you have disconnected the five additional couplings down here, you may then set about with the winches as well as the safety, knocking out the pins and leaving the track on its own standing against the sprags. You then drive around, slowly advance, knocking out the connectors or the sprags as you get to them. By the time you get to the front, you now do exactly the same unblocking thing with the other track and then you have to tie together the two track halves. This creates your trailer. Once you create your trailer, you then have to tow the thing. So you take your tow bar, uh, tow cables, correction, but there is actually a tow bar as well if you have to reverse. You take your brake spools, they perform a braking function with a rope, and somebody walks along the, the trailer as the T28 is crawling away at about three miles an hour. They get across the bridge or onto the train or whatever this narrow thing is, and he literally, if you wanted to turn right, you pull on the rope and that's how you turn. Then you get to the far side and you put the whole thing back together again. Now this takes about four hours if you're not familiar with it. If you are familiar with it, it took about two and a half. Uh, I haven't actually asked how long it took him to do it here when it finally did reassemble it. I suspect most of a day, simply because they're being careful. And yeah, that's, uh, the engineer said you could knock it down by an hour if you use a different pin design but it's not convenient it's not easy and you really had to plan your route to make sure you didn't come across any narrow bridges if you look in the back of the vehicle firstly well obviously you got the wide four tracks then you got the reasonably wide final drives now there were two sets of final drives that were shipped with the vehicle uh, one set was a somewhat taller gear ratio than the other, which if I do my maths correctly, meant that in theory, if you fitted the other final drive, you could get a top speed in excess of 12 miles an hour. However, there is nothing in the records indicating that they actually trialed the vehicle with those uh, final drives. But remember, this is a 90 ton vehicle, 95 ton, it's still got to get up a few hills. So because of the low gearing ratio, it was still able to go up to a 48% grade. Oh, maximum reverse speed, by the way, is four miles an hour. As you move inwards a little bit, the exhaust, well, it's just like a Pershing exhaust because it is basically a Pershing powertrain, a single exhaust over the central rear, right on top of your pintle. So hopefully if you have to pull something off, you haven't been driving for the last God knows how long and burning your hands. Tail lights, yeah, that's pretty much it. Oh, by the way, you will have noticed the front of it had a regular service headlight, blackout light, and even a horn a little bit back into the right of the front. Now, you may have concluded from all this that operational mobility was not a particular design requirement. Well, that's probably fair to say. Then again, the targets it was designed to go up against were hardly particularly mobile either. So it does kind of work out. Now, powering the whole thing, and it has been removed from the vehicle and it's sitting somewhere in a, in a hangar on the other side of the base, was effectively the powertrain of the T26E1, a pre-Pershing in effect. The Ford GAF a V12, 1100 cubic inches, put out about 500 horsepower. Now, this wasn't actually too bad for the vehicle. I mean, if you look at the figures, it was quite impressive. From a standing start, it would get the maximum speed in 8.8 .8 seconds. From that maximum speed, it would come to a halt in less than nine and a half feet. What was this blistering maximum speed, you may ask? Well, it was clocked in on the course at 8.8 .8 miles an hour, with a recommended cruising speed of seven. Now, the testing program was originally designed for 2,000 miles, because that was your typical basic, basic, not extended, testing program for a US vehicle at a time. Now, you can imagine that at 8.8 .8 miles an hour, this is going to take a while. So there is a report or a letter in the archive saying that we request a reduction in the mileage for this test to 1,000 miles. It didn't get that far either. The test program was curtailed at 541 miles. Or still at a cruising speed of 8.8, .8, no, correction, seven miles an hour, probably took a while. Fuel consumption, if you're curious, was 0 0.16 miles to the gallon. And with 400 gallons in the tanks, that would get you a cruising range of about 65 miles between top-ups, which is probably not the worst of their problems. 
Uh, oh, some of the other figures, the trench crossing is six and a half foot. They took a look at the 42 inch wall. They took a look at the less than 42 inch gap between the front fenders and the ground that didn't even bother trying. Right, I think that about covers it uh, for the exterior of T28. So if you don't mind coming back for part two, we'll take you inside. Till then, take care. I'll see you on the next one.